Hi, Deacon Bob here. During Easter of 2022, we decided that we would take the ends of our episodes and focus on the seven petitions of the Our Father Prayer. For those keeping score at home, that was episodes 79 to 87. Uh, we had an extra episode in there because we went to go see Top Gun Maverick. Anyway, what we've done is we have taken all of those bits and put them into one supercut episode, which is here for you right now. We hope you enjoy it. We hope you're blessed by it. And if you can think of someone else that might really be blessed by it, we hope you share it. God bless. The opening line of the Our Father prayer is, Our Father who art in heaven. The rest are petitions. There's seven more petitions that we'll get into for the remaining podcasts. But we want to start with that focus because it really uh, sets the tone, not just for the Our Father prayer, sometimes known as the Lord's Prayer because it's a prayer Jesus gave us, uh, but it sets the tone for the prayer, but also the way that we should be praying. And the Our Father prayer is given to us in the context of the Sermon on the Mound. And part of the revelation of that beautiful Sermon on the Mound is this understanding of God as our Father. Um, you know, the Jewish people really didn't refer to God our Father. There, there were some images of God as Father in the Old Testament. Um, that, was a very, that was a very unique emphasis, unique contribution that Jesus gave us. You know, when you want to call God our Father, uh, specifically Abba, which is like a, not quite daddy, but a beloved father, um, mm -hmm. an intimate mm -hmm. relationship, a very personal idea in a familial image that would really resonate, particularly with the Jewish people at the time, but I think resonates throughout all of history. And so, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, on one point, yeah, I think that, that there was something that spoke to the deeper of the heart, but it would also be very um, jarring for them. Mm. To, so, I mean, to speak of God in this personal nature as a father, as a daddy would, I mean, that's obviously what gets them in trouble with some of them is that that's just not something that they were familiar with. But it is primarily the revelation of Christ that the first person is his father. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea of that type of intimacy uh, really yeah. is such a hallmark of the preaching of Jesus. And you're right. You know, even as we just went through Holy Week, some people would say like, well, he dared to call God his father. Like that was... That was like, who, who do you think you are? Like, we don't, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, when Moses, you know, when, when God reveals himself to Moses, he doesn't say, call me daddy. <laughs> he says, I am who I am. They wouldn't even say that name. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so this idea of the apostles come to Jesus and say, can you teach us how to pray? That's, I think that's such a beautiful part of it. Like the gift of the Our Father prayer is given when the apostles see something very different about the way Jesus prayed. And that, I think, sets the tone because the Our Father invites us to pray differently, or it should. It gives us a whole new meaning to a relationship with God that was, at least from that Jewish context, beyond a sacrifice and a ritual and even an obsession about how we might wash our hands or what we might do. And this idea of when you pray, pray like this, our mm. Father. Um, so that concept of Father is so beautiful. And the concept of our, um, you know, the catechism clarifies like that, that's not like necessarily more of a possessive, you know, like it's my Father, in the sense that there is a universality of God and an invitation that God wants to be everybody's Father. Mm -hmm. But also in the manner in which we relate to each other, um, you know, this idea of our Father. You know, I've, I've spoken a, a bit about ecumenism and how passionate I am about, you know, just praying with other Christians and, and doing what I can to unite the body of Christ. I love this quote from the Catechism. It says, for this reason, in spite of the divisions among Christians, this prayer to, and it puts in quote, our Father, remains our common retains our common patrimony and urgent summons for all the baptized. In communion by faith in Christ and by baptism, they ought to join in Jesus' prayer for the unity of his disciples. And I can say in times when I've been with other Christians, and sometimes, you know, that we listen to different music, certainly any kind of liturgical action is very different. But one thing we always try to do is we try to end with the Our Father prayer. And that really is this moment of 
just profound unity. Mm -hmm. Like when we pray, mm -hmm. we pray mm -hmm. this together, and it's pretty awesome. That's cool. Uh, and, and I was always struck by that, that it's not, yeah, it's not a personal thing. It's we're coming together, a common father. But you, you alluded to something, and, and it's interesting you said that Jesus dared say this, but that's when the priest at Mass, mm. when uh, he, the priest introduces the Our Father, he says, uh, we dare to say. And, and that's, that's kind of an interesting that, that when, and again, I think this is why I'm looking forward to do this with the Our Father is because we just do it, we do it every time we pray the rosary, yep. we do it every time we go to Mass, we do it every time we do the chaplet of our mercy, we just, it's just kind of, you say to Our Father, but, but to really take a moment to step back and, and, and reflect and pray about what we're saying, but that, that the church, the official words of the church say, we dare to say yeah. that there's something courageous about praying like this. So. Uh, I think it's a great blessing for us to be able to spend the next many weeks uh, unpacking what we're praying, and, and maybe by the end of it, we've got a deeper understanding of, of what it is we're trying to do and what it is we're actually saying. So it should be great. Yeah, that idea of that boldness, that audacity, and we hope yeah. certainly as we kind of continue to dig and unpack this beautiful prayer that we would realize how the words that come out of our mouth with all these petitions are just shocking. And, yeah. you know, who gives you the right to say this? Well, that's why it's called the Lord's Prayer. Like, no, yeah. no human would have written this prayer. I mean, obviously, Jesus yeah, was fully bold. human and, you know, divine. But, like, in that <laughs> sense, like, nobody else would have the right to say, this is a good way to pray except the Son, except yeah. God himself. And what's glorious about it is it is this idea of, Jesus, how do you pray? Oh, well, let me tell you, this is how I pray as yeah. fully God and fully man. And these are the words we use. And that is why the church puts this prayer in such prime locations, such prime real estate. You know, the Liturgy of the Hours always ends, not with the Hail Mary, and, and Our Father. Um, you know, the moment you mention in the liturgy, where do we pray the Our Father? It's at that moment of the consecration. We say amen. And now Christ is on the altar before us. And what do we do as a community of faith? We dare to say, our Father. It's like it's almost like the first things that we want Jesus to hear on the altar, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, is this prayer, because the whole liturgy is a prayer to the Father from the Son. So what more perfectly could we say after the Amen, except our Father, who art in heaven? And maybe one last little mm -hmm. comment about it that I really like, you know, this idea of art in heaven. Um, the Catechism says this, the biblical expression of God being in heaven isn't so much trying to convey that God isn't here. Like, it, you know, our Father who art in so heaven not isn't... not merely a place. Right, it's not a place. It's not like we're addressing an envelope and it's like, our Father, heaven, 43952, right? It's, it's actually a comment, of course, because he'd be in our zip code at Steubenville, Ohio. Um, but I love, uh, this is a quote from Augustine. Our Father who art in heaven is rightly understood to mean that God is in the hearts of the just as in his holy temple. At the same time, it means that those who pray should desire the one they invoke to dwell in them. And this refers to the kingdom of heaven being among us, as Jesus proclaimed so frequently. This idea that we do want to acknowledge by saying God is in heaven, the majesty of God, you know, the immensity of God, the holiness of God, the eternity of God, and a God who dwells in our hearts, and a God who dwells in our midst. Right. And so and as we begin to... Oh, go ahead. Isn't that exactly what Christ did? Is is he brings he he tears away this veil? He brings heaven on earth. Yes. I mean that's part of the the petition we're eventually going to get to. Yeah, yeah, and that's the yeah. whole actually movement of the entire prayer. So when next you pray, Our Father who art in heaven, think of your adoption, your spiritual adoption that was won for you through the blood of Jesus Christ that we just celebrated in Easter. Think of the hour of it, the brothers and sisters we have, who are Catholic, who call themselves Christian, the, the rite of the baptized, and just the glory and majesty of God who is eternal and yet lives in our heart. That's the attitude that Jesus tells us we need to have before we get to the petitions, mm -hmm. this humble recognition of a God who wants to be intimate with us, who is ever-present and particularly present in our hearts and wants to unite us together as his people, as his family, before we ask for one single thing. Amen. Yeah. 
So today we are continuing our journey deeper into the heart of the Our Father prayer. We began with Our Father who art in heaven, making it clear that that doesn't mean he is somewhere else, but uh, the kingdom of heaven is among us. And now we're getting into the petitions. There are seven petitions in the Our Father prayer. The first three have to do with God, and the other four have to do with us. Hallowed be thy name. Actually, I was just going to say that. Oh, that, that sorry. Did no, I steal no, it no, 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 that's really good. I, I, again, this is all, I think, I'm really, actually really excited for this. I, I enjoyed just praying about this and talking about this, but I was going to say that very thing, just to kind of give context that the first three are more theological and drastic as well. Yeah, so uh, our the first petition today is, Hallowed be thy name. Uh, and what we're asking, it's funny because when you first look at it, it's like, all right, God's name already is holy, so why are we praying this? <laughs> but but, but the, the movement of this petition is not merely to recognize, or not merely to say, okay, God, your name is holy, but a couple things. One, to recognize that God is in fact holy, yeah. that in his very nature, God is holy, and God gives himself a name, he reveals himself, as we hear in, in the Old Testament, is uh, I am who am, right? The one mm. who is. So we're asking that, that we can recognize that, that we can recognize that the Lord's name is holy, but it's already, by our praying for that and our desiring to know that doesn't, in fact, make God more holy, right? Because yeah. God already is objectively holy. So what the prayer is, is that by his holiness, that each one of us is, is made holy. Mm. In, in the Catechism in 20, uh, 28, 13, it says, In the waters of baptism we have been sanctified. And then it goes on and says, The Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God, our Father, calls us to holiness in the whole of our life. And since he is the source of holiness in Christ Jesus who became the wisdom of God and the sanctification both his glory and our life are depend on the hallowing the holiness of his name mm. and such is the urgency of the first petition uh, and then and then later it says um when we see say hallowed by hallowed be thy name we ask that it should be hallowed in us that his holiness now I'm I'm just commentating commentating yeah sure okay his it's holiness not the worst okay fumble verbal no, but, fumble but again today. I, again to prove our <laughs> ignorance all right um but that right they, that when we come to a deeper understanding of that god is holy then we understand that, that that's his desire for us and that we are made holy because he is holy holiness i think sometimes we have this attitude that holiness is necessarily perfection or necessarily us getting everything right but I think at the heart of holiness is a relationship that yeah. we come to understand more deeply that God is holy. And he says very ser very clear in the scripture, be holy for I am holy. And that's yeah. what we're praying in this, that, that we recognize the Lord's holiness. And the, the readings on Sunday were so beautiful about, you know, the saints and the angels and all of creation worshiping and adoring. And, and I love it. it says they're shouting out. There's something mm. about that. They're shouting and they fall down, it says, in, in worship and adoration of the God who is holy. So um, in, in it also says in the Catechism in 2815, it says this petition embodies all the others. Mm. So the fact that it's the first one that we're talking about, all of the other si um, six petitions flow from this one, yeah. and it is the prayer of the Christ that leads us to holiness. It's the fulfillment of the other petitions that make this one occur, you know, which is, you're right, we're not, um, we don't make God's, God's name is holy. So and there's a few linguistic things. We'll hit this with uh, as we go through the petitions because sometimes it's it's worded in a trans the translation of it can be worded in an awkward way that makes it sound like we're saying, "I'm going to make your name holy. holy, like your name is holy." However, there is a manner by which our actions do make God's name holy, particularly as we talk about sharing faith to other people. That when we do holy things, we hallow His name. You know, like if if only it could be that anybody who is a disciple of Jesus, you know, when, when people see a Christian, they go, wow, that God must be holy because right, look right. at the it's lives true. of the followers. The inverse is true. When we see scandal, when we see sin, people think, well, Christianity, huh, you know, it's just a right wing political movement these days. I mean, it really it defames the name of God. Um, I think about how often God's name is taken in vain. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a direct counter to, you know, the second commandment, which is to keep, you know, God's name holy. And now we see that reflected in this prayer that we are really praying, God, that we want, you know, we want, we want humanity to know the holiness of your name. We want people to respect your name. We want people to have an awe of your name and of your holiness, and we want to do things— in our worship, in our behavior, in our life, that make it clear that your name is holy. And I want people to see 
what I do as a Catholic, as a faithful husband, and, and I and I father, and I want them, you know, to say, "Wow, God is holy." You know, God is great. God is good, and that's all. And that's packed the, in that phrase. Yeah, and one of the I appreciate the fact. Obviously, we we pray the Our Father every time we ce- celebrate Mass together, every time we pray the Rosary, but it is. The, I think it's most maybe most beautifully seen in the body of Christ mm. is that there's there's an attitude I think among some that says holiness. The, the image I use is a French butler or an English butcher, butler, right? He's very proper and very staid and very you know serious. And and the holiness is is you being you, you mm-hmm. know, and being the person that God's created you to be. And 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 that's one of the things I love about the the, the church. You've got. You've got Thomas Aquinas, uh, who is a pr- pr- profound intellect, and then you've got Francis of Assisi, and you've yep. got rich, and you've got poor, you've got um, smart and not so smart. I mean, <laughs> that's holiness is ultimately it's about a relationship with Jesus and, and and being transformed in my life, beginning to reflect Jesus. So a danger would be to say that holiness is like necessarily like that or necessarily like that. I always joke that. The, the really holy people keep incense in their pocket all the time, just in case you need it, right? Right. But but it's it's you being again rooting out sinfulness and all that kind of thing. I, we get that, but it's it's about being relationship and having our life transformed. And that's what this, our Father Horan, hallowed be holy be your name. That, that we recognize that, recognize the call that the Lord has on our life. The last thing I want to say about that is so true. You know, God is love and God is holy. Therefore, holiness is love. Mm-hmm. It's the fullness of love. It's mm-hmm. the expression of love. It's all the gifts of the Spirit, joy, peace, faithfulness, gentleness. You know, like all those things really do wrap up into holiness. You know, one of my favorite, at least my own mental images of holiness, came when I was working in, um, I was a theater major in college, and I was doing set design. And in set design, you know, we painted sets, and of course you learn about the primary colors, you know, which is, you know, red, yellow, and blue, mm-hmm. and you mix them. And if you mix them all together, they're black. And if you take all the color out, it's white. Well, what was interesting is when I went to lighting design, it wasn't red, yellow, and blue. There's slightly different variations. And actually, the principle is opposite. When you remove all color in light, it's black. Hmm. When you add all color, it's white. To get w- a perfectly white light is a, a balance of all oh, that's colors. That's interesting. And that's holiness. Mm. I mean, I think sometimes we think of it like holiness means you remove everything out of it, mm. you know, because, and it's so hard to get like white. I mean, it's so much easier to get black or dirty. You just mm. add one little dot. I mean, if you ever go to like Home Depot, I'm always amazed. Like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like three dots of red and it's like, it's red. It's like, how did that happen? You just yeah. need a little bit of that color. But in light, it's about all the colors. It's the entire spectrum. And holiness is a yes. And that's God, right? God is every color. He is joy. He is love. It is a vibrant invitation to be like him and to live in his mm. holiness. And then I think as disciples of Jesus, that's the light we should be radiating. And that's certainly what we're praying for when we say, hallowed be thy name. Amen. And today we're taking a look at this idea of thy kingdom come. And what's cool about this, as I was reflecting, we're, we're using the catechism, uh, those that want to follow along at home, uh, 26, 2816 and following. Uh, that's really our, our main text as we're reflecting on, uh, on this prayer, this beautiful, beautiful prayer. More than just a beautiful prayer, the prayer of all prayers really is what the Our Father prayer is. But the idea of the, the heart of thy kingdom come, we're actually praying for the end of the world. I don't know if I think about that when I pray the Our Father. But the full culmination, now there's other meanings to sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. But the catechism highlights that the, the full culmination of this petition is Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. It's um, the second coming of Jesus. It is him claiming the victory that he won on the cross. Uh, it is the new heaven and the new earth. And we are truly praying for that moment to happen. And, and the last words of the book of Revelation are Maranatha, come Lord mm-hmm, Jesus. Mm-hmm. That we are, as Christians, you know, we say this in the creed. It's another thing that I think sometimes we don't pay attention to. It's not just I believe in the resurrection of the dead. We actually say, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. And this really ties in beautifully to our theme of hope because hope is rooted in eternity. (coughs) It is rooted in God's victory that we should be more conscious of 
you know, keeping our eyes fixed on things above, not on things below, because on things below, they're passing, but what is above is eternal. And the Our Father prayer, after praying that God's name would be held holy, would be glorified, we're also praying, and, and bring it, like bring the fulfillment of your kingdom, answer every promise you've given, you know, completely free us from sin and death and sickness and all those things, you know, that have occurred in this human existence. And we just want to live eternally in your glory, again, with that new heaven, mm-hmm. the new earth, the resurrection of the dead. And that's, that's as I was that's, reflecting on it, that's just powerful. Yeah, that's cool because, in, in, in well, I'm sure we'll go here. It's, it's not to say that we don't desire the Lord's will in our life every day. You right, know, right. Bring your kingdom, because that is a part of it. Yes. But, but the end goal is just that. And it's, it's, it's really great because we don't think a lot about that. At least, I, I, yeah, I don't think a lot about what is that end time going to look like? What is the second coming going to look like? And, and that we're actually hoping and praying that that would come. In fact, we have a lot of students right now that are praying that that would come before the end of their exams, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. Right. But, but then a part of that or a taste of that is the, the will of the Father being present in our life, that his kingdom becoming more alive in my life, that I experience his conversion more and more in my life. Is that, is that those two things go together, right? Yeah, yeah. Ab- okay. absolutely. I remember awesome. when I was younger, and I learned, I remember somebody told me about that prayer. Every time you pray the Our Father prayer, you're actually asking for Jesus to come again. And I remembered as a teenager, I thought, can you, can you come after the Star Wars prequels are yeah, finished? Yeah. And now I kind of say, you could have come before that. You know, that would have, that would have been okay. Um, uh, Catechism 2818, in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come refers primarily, as we mentioned, to the final coming of the reign of God through Christ's return. But, and this goes to your point, Father Dave, far from distracting the church from her mission in this present world, this desire commits her to it all the more strongly. Since Pentecost, the coming of that reign is the work of the Spirit of the Lord, who completes his work on earth and brings us the fullness of grace. So it isn't an attitude of, you know what, Jesus is coming again, so who cares about anything? Mm-hmm. It, you know, if anything, uh, that understanding that Christ is coming again should make us that much more fervent in prayer, more fervent in serving those in need, since we certainly know at the end of time it's recognizing Christ in mm-hmm. those who are most in need that bring us into, you know, the, the yeah, kingdom yeah, yeah. of God. Yeah. Uh, it's proclaiming the word. You know, it's, it's sharing the gospel with people who might not be able to know that, in fact, all these things will be passing away. So far from being a, um, you know, kind of an excuse of like, oh, I'm just going to, I know I'm going to heaven and nothing yeah, else yeah. matters. It really, no, actually, that should make us that much more committed, yeah, yeah, yeah. committed to the to the Lord's, you know, it, it'll get into thy will be done, which is the next petition, mm-hmm. but the Lord's desire for us on earth and uh, that movement of the Spirit that would allow us to bring God's glory into every moment of our life. It's it's going to be kind of wild, isn't it? I mean, you just, what, yeah, yeah right. I mean, is it, it's just, I don't know, to, to imagine, it, it, yeah, you, you see this light and you see, I don't know, is it going to be on an ocean? I don't know, it's just, yeah, weird. It's just hard the, to, on the shore, on the mountains. I yeah. mean, it's probably not going to be an earth at all, obviously. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's going to be cool. Yeah, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. It's going to be um, like everybody's going to be videoing it. So it's going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> the the virtual event. Jesus so, is going to say, please, right. please put, put away your phones, your phones. down. There's something put, bigger put here. Put it down. They're all putting like little filters on that's Jesus. Right, like, right. oh, I'm going to put a crown on him. I'm going to make him look like a cat. My, uh, so my sister, this is just to kind of bring us to a conclusion. She sends me, um, my nephew is learning the Our Father. Okay. And this is his, there's a little video that she sent me of him, of him trying it. It says, um, Our Father who art in heaven, how do you know my name? <laughs> Uh, how kingdom come that will be done on Amazon and send us evil. Wow. Yeah. There yeah. You go. So he's four. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's getting it. But yeah. I, I thought that was, uh, he's, he's got a great insight in the gift of the Our Father. Well, it is beautiful that we, uh, we learn this prayer yeah, from yeah. our youth, but sometimes uh, we really. There's more to learn. There's so, there's so much more to learn, and we hope you're being blessed right, by and that's, these that, conversations. That's, exa- that that's exactly what I was going to say. My hope is that is that we have a danger, I think, at times, and it's just part of it. We just kind of go through the prayer. We say the Our Father because we say the Our Father. But if in the end of this it can mean something more to us as we pray it and it's not merely words, uh, I think that'll be a great blessing. And today we're talking about 
Thy will, will be, be done, done on, on earth, earth as it is, is in, in heaven. heaven. And I believe it's around Catechism 2822. Ooh, is that yes. around right? 2822, yes. Yeah, so this is this is the prayer. First off, the Lord's will is always going to be done. And this is one of the things that's important, that his ultimately his will is going to come about. Now, yeah. whether or not we're participating in that's a whole other question. Yeah. But it's like um, what we're praying is that we can participate with the will of God. Yes. So so that's that's key to that. And, and we ask our questions, well, what is the will of the Father? And, and that's one of the things that we look to Jesus and that Jesus ultimately perfectly fulfills the will of the Father. So what we're praying is that the Father's will, God's will can be made reality yeah. on, ev- on, on earth and that we participate in that. And I think that's one of the things that's really key is, is that the Lord uses us to participate in bringing about his will and his desire. So one of the things that catechism talks about is the will of the Father is that all, is, all people are saved. Yeah, amen. And then that's important. So if we say your will in heaven, well, what is the will of the Father in heaven? That all of his sons and daughters would be saved. So that is, that's really the starting point when we talk about that. What is the ultimately the goal, the desire, the, the, the prayer of, the, of Jesus' heart is that all people would come to salvation. So that's one of the things that, that we reflect on is that the Lord uses us in bringing about salvation of other people. By, not by, by the merits of Jesus, obviously, right. but by right, us right. witnessing to it. Um, and the other part is that, that we perform the will, that we act like Jesus did, so that we love the way that Jesus loved us. Yeah. So when he says, love one another as I have loved you, that that is a part, the catechism speaks, that that ability for us to love as Jesus loved is making the will of the Father present in the earth. I love this. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking, I have, so I, have this, I found the quote of C.S. Lewis, which is on my phone which is on that tripod yeah, yeah, and okay. filming us right now. So I'm going to paraphrase the quote, but it's from The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. And he said, essentially, uh, everybody, com- there comes down to two kinds of people. There's the one to whom says to God, thy will be done. And then there's the one to whom God says to the person, thy will be done. And those are the ones that go to hell. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's about either we're surrendering our will to God or we're asking God to surrender to our will, and sadly, that usually leads us to uh, that leads us to destruction. One of the things that I found really fascinating when here on campus, I remember taking a Christology course, and they talk about the idea of Jesus, hypostatic union, one divine person, two natures, a human nature and a divine nature, and our intellect and will is in our nature, not in our person. So Jesus actually had two wills, a human will and a divine will. Now, this is why this is important. What we see in the garden is Jesus surrendering his human will to the Father. Now, if he didn't do that, you could argue he wasn't really human, because this is the drama, I think, of all of our lives, Mm -hmm. is the willingness to surrender our will to the Father. If there's not a conflict, it's really not much of a surrender. If you always agree with God, then this isn't really that much of a big deal. You know, we're just kind of kind of going along with things. But this idea that we would um, say to God, not my will be done, but thy will be done, that I would trust that your will is better than my will. And to be honest, that we would also in humility realize, you know, I, I'm probably not willing the right thing here. <laughs> like, you know, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, my you will fulfill my desires in ways I, I probably don't understand, yeah. and that might be through a path of suffering or darkness well, that I wouldn't the, normally go the, to. The, the Catechism speaks about that. It says, although he was son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Yeah, on uh, Catechism twenty eight twenty five, and and that that that's really uh, it, very much at the heart of this this acceptance of the will. I mean, I'm, I know that Jesus didn't do this because I would appreciate it, yep. but I so appreciate the fact that he wrestled in the garden. Yeah. You know, Amen. I mean, it just. It makes it so much more real and honest to me that that if if this could pass, you know, right. if this could pass, I'd really appreciate it. That would be fantastic yes. if this could pass. But ultimately, not my will be done, but yours. Yeah, and he wasn't a robot. No, no, yeah, no. He was, I mean, any human being would face death and say, "No, please." Yeah, yeah. Or suffering. No, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you yeah. know, if if there's a way we can do it, and I, this is actually my favorite line in the Catechism about this. It talks about. We ask, this is the same number, 2825, we ask our Father to unite our will to his sons in order to fulfill his will. We are radically incapable of this. What a great line that is. We are radically incapable of this. But, but. United with Jesus, 
and with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can surrender our will to him and decide to choose what his son has always chosen to do what is pleasing to the Father. And I think that's the beauty of this petition, because you could say, isn't God's will done already, right? You know, like, do I need to pray this prayer for God's will to be done? Isn't it going to be done? And and specifically, though, it's saying, I want to... I want to accept this will. Right. Like, I want to participate in yeah, this. Yeah, I, right? I, I want to say yes to it. One of my uh, favorite antiphons in uh, the Liturgy of the Hours, it comes up every once in a while, and it says, incline my heart according to, according yeah. to your will, O God. And every time I, I pray that, I just think, like, that's it. Like, that's what, that's, and that's why the Our Father is the perfect prayer. Right. Like, you know, because we learn to pray from these petitions. We're actually saying, you know, you know, because sometimes you read in Scripture, um, Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will give you. And you think, I want a pony. Yeah. I want a million dollars. Yeah. Like, in Jesus' name, give me a million dollars. Well, that didn't work. But really what the, this idea about praying in Jesus' name is, is, is in praying in Jesus' will. And it's actually saying, God, I want to love what you love and hate what you hate. I want to want what you want. And in this moment of prayer, it's not about me coming to you saying, I need this, this, and this. Would you please change my heart so that I see the world the way you see the world and yeah. that your will would be done in my life, in the way I treat others, in my family, in everything I'm doing, that that would be my driving issue is not so much, God, I want you to do my will. It's change my heart that I would just desire your will to be and, done. And I think, what, just to reiterate what you said and what the catechism says, is that on our own we are incapable of doing that. Radically incapable. Yeah, radically incapable yeah, not of even doing close. that. Because, because of brokenness, because of fear, because of selfishness, because yeah. of sin, because of you know the, the, fallen, the fallen nature, right? But, but one of the things that Jesus proves is, is that it is possible for yeah. us to be able to do that. But again, not apart from the Holy Spirit. It says, when united with Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit... And then the next one, 28, 26, and it says, by prayer we can discern mm. what is the will of God. And I think that that's important, that, that God desires his will to be made known to us. I told the students at graduation um, on Saturday, our theme was 127.1. Is that the verse? Psalm, is, is, yeah. Yeah, Psalm, Psalm 127.1. Uh, unless the Lord builds a house in vain, does the builder labor? Vain and, does the labor. Build, build, vain does the builder labor. What's the line from the show, Let It Be Done? No, may it be? I have spoken. I have spoken, right, I have spoken. But um, what I said is that, you know, if, if, if you're building in your own, your own plan, your own desires, your own hope, you're going to be frustrated. Mm. You're going to be at times angry, uh, confused, and frightened if you're building on your own will. I said, if you're allowing the Lord to build, you're going to be at times frustrated, angry, and confused. <laughs> yes, I thought that was great. But but ultimately, it's 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 life giving. It's yes. an adventure. It's it's the Lord's presence. It's His plan for your life, and that's so much. I mean, Bob, yeah, I'm going to get emotional. Thirty years ago, did you and I think we would be sitting here, working at this university, doing what we're doing, doing this podcast? It's just changing the world. I mean. One marriage at a time. Maybe, but it's just so much more. I mean, his Amen. desire for our life is just so much more than we can possibly imagine. And, you know, I was re this, this weekend, one of the, a couple of the parents were, they're also alumni, and they were just talking about, you know, how the Lord has worked in their life. And, and it's just, I mean, I don't know how to say it. It's, it was just in their marriage. It was in raising their kids. It, it, I mean, this sounds bad, but it's not like they were going to some war, war torn region and, and, engaging the enemy it was just they were living their life and, and they were talking about how beautiful it's been and yeah. how surprising and an adventure it's been but that is just it is us surrendering to the will of god trusting even in the midst of the cross that's why the catechism spends time on, on suffering because sometimes the will of the father is is a cross yes um, but he's he's with us right he's not alone and that's what the the cross reminds us that, that we're not alone in the midst of that one of, possibly, one of possibly my favorite things in the whole catechism is when it talks about original sin, and it has a, such an insightful comment, and it said that the first sin was disobedience to God and a lack of trust in his providence, that Adam and Eve, our, our great-great-great-grandparents, fell into sin because they actually believed when the devil said, no, 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 you're not going to die. He knows if you eat of this, you're going to be like God's, that they felt like God was holding out on them. 
and this prayer, thy will be done, goes directly against that sin in, in the positive sense. It's about, I trust in you, God. Mm-hmm. Like, even if it's, even if I'm going through the shadow of the valley of death, I, I will you're fear no be, evil. I know, I know you're, you're going to be present. I know you're going to get me through this. I know that your will is better than what I think I want Mm -hmm. because I know you want what I want and that your plans are perfect and your plans are for my welfare and not for my woe. And so it is this moment of surrender, which we really feel in the most difficult times. Again, it's easy to go along with God's will when it happens to go along with our will, you know? And yeah, that sounds great. I, I liked that too. You know, there's some people that are they're almost Catholic by coincidence. You know, I believe in a God that loves. Well, so do I. You know, I believe in a God that's merciful. Well, so do I. I believe in a God that loves their enemies. Whoa, wait a second. Yeah, yeah. You know, time out, time out, time out, you know. And it's in these difficult moments like we see in Jesus in the garden. And I love how the catechism brings that moment that moment to fruition. Like when you pray this, I, you know, this is the prayer of Jesus, right? He's going to fulfill this. He's going to be at the moment. Or even the divine word is going to say, Dad, if this could pass, yeah. I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. But this isn't about what this isn't about what I want. And, and I, it, it's interesting. Just over the years, the number of times I've I've told students or people that I'm I'm praying with or confession or direction, spiritual direction, that to to wrestle with that is okay. It's not a lack of faith to yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I remember when my father was passing and I was saying, like, just take this away. I mean, right. that's not a lack of faith. That's human. Yeah, it's, it's, but, but what, what is graced about what we believe is that Jesus, like, yeah, just think about when I was praying that with my father and, and I was sitting in a car outside the hospital by myself and it was just so hard. And I said, I just don't want to deal with this and, and I don't want to have to, you know, to drink of the cup. But Bob, there, Jesus just met me in that, and 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 I know that that's not always everyone's case. It's not always everyone my case, right? But because I've experienced and I've tasted enough that I know Jesus is with me in the middle of it, you mm-hmm. know. And and that that's the promise that His will, you know, is is sometimes this is hard to believe, but it's it's light. His burden is light because He carries it with us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Now we've got four more petitions, uh, and today we're talking about give us this day our daily bread. And we are reading uh, Catechism 2828 and following to uh, 2837, uh, just as the highlights of it. If you want to, those of you following along at home, and man, I, um, so I always think Eucharist, right? And that's not wrong. You no, know, there's, no. there, there's a manner in which, you know, I think the daily bread, what's our daily bread? The Eucharist. But I realized as I reflected on what the church had to teach us about it, you know, just like the liturgy is more than just reception of the Eucharist, um, though the Eucharist is at the heart of it and the pinnacle of it, same with this petition. Okay, let me just underline that point. That's a really important point, is is that that the Eucharist is, the celebration of the Eucharist is also a proclamation of the Word. It's also a community Mm. gathered. It's also recognizing of the symbol of the priest. So... That's really important that I think sometimes we go to liturgy and it's, it's just everything's just kind of fluff until we get to the Eucharist. And, and like you said, it's, it's the, the font, of this, it's primary, but it's, it's taken in the context of liturgy. Right. Yep. Yeah. And then people receive it and they take off and they don't know why people are like, maybe you should stay. Maybe you could but wait if the only, is over. But if the only reason you were there in your mind to is something. to get the Eucharist, yeah. well, there you go. There. And I'd say in a similar way, the beautiful thing of this petition is, yes, spoiler alert, we're going to get to the Eucharist at the heart of this petition, but there is so much more. It actually, the catechism breaks this, breaks this into different phrases. So give us is the first part of this. And it talks about this filial trust. Like my kids always like, give me something. It's not mm-hmm. even polite about it. I'm like, can you say the magic word? But this idea that now. we depend on our dad. Remember, this is the Our Father prayer. And we have this filial trust that we can ask our father for what we need. In fact, that's what something that Jesus said. Which of you, as evil as you are, if your son asked for a piece of bread, would give him a stone? Sure. So if that's how you behave to each other, how much more will your heavenly father take care of you? And so this is a part of the expectation of God's providence in our life, that we can say, 
give me this. Right, you know, right, right, you right. Know, the, the trust of children who look to their father for everything is beautiful. Yeah. That was the statement it made. And I love, again, the, the, when, I, when I focus on that, it's a younger child. It's not, it's, you know, it's not, there's something innocent and something beautiful about a child coming and, and wanting or needing and, and the father delighting in being able to give that to them. Yeah. It must be cool, like on Christmas, to give kids yeah, their birthdays cool. and stuff. Yeah, there's just something about that that's really beautiful. Sometimes I'm more excited to give them. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, are, exactly. You know, exactly. So, that's cool. Um, so give us is an that's expression of trust. That's because you guys usually share the same gifts, but that's a side Shh. note. Thankfully, my kids don't listen to this podcast. Um, this day, it goes on to say, is also an expression of trust taught to us by the Lord because there's a lot of symbolism in the today right, the day. of God. Yeah. You know, like this day is the day of the resurrection. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. You know, there, there's this statement of we are living in a new day that the Lord has made, and it's a day of resurrection. It's a day of life. And so this is the moment, this is the day that we're right. coming before the Lord in resurrection, you know, anticipation and hope. Right. The other day is it's this day of this, the day this, one of the other, you know, ideas of the day is the day that the two worlds collide, that the kingdom of God, the mm-hmm. kingdom, that the, they come together in the incarnation. So that day is this like almost a culmination of the two worlds coming together. Yeah, so. amen. And then we get to our bread. And what was cool that this was the thing, as I reflected on this and read this, that really struck me the most. It talks about there is a material level to this, and there's the spiritual. Like I said, I quickly jumped to the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. But it talks about like meeting the material needs. Like we have a God who isn't just spiritual without any material. Like, he really does want to provide for us. And we want to be praying um, not only for our material needs, but it goes back to this thing. This idea of the phrase, give us, is different than give me. Mm -hmm. And when we pray this prayer, we're praying it as a body of Christ, and we're praying it for others. There are people who are hungry. I mean, just literally, physically hungry, who really actually would just love to have some actual bread. I mean, like, Mm -hmm. beyond any symbolism or anything else— and so just to think, like, gosh, there are people who are dying of hunger right now. Mm. Give us this day. Like, we are praying this together as a human family, that needs would be met, that, uh, you know, material needs would be met. Yeah, and maybe just word, and I realize that the Our Father is not, the only place is not, it's not only in the Eucharist that we celebrate and we pray the Our Father, but one of the things that I appreciate about that is give us our daily bread and that the Eucharist is not this personal, just this personal Jesus right. and me, but it's a community gathered. And, and I think that's really imperative that we think about that, that a part, I mean, that's what's so central about the Eucharist is we come together as a community, we come together broken, we come together hungry. And some days I'm better than, than the person, I, I'm feeling better, I'm feeling more nourished, more full than the person next to me. So we're praying for that person next to me, the one that's really hungry, that we may not even be aware of. And the idea is, uh, this great quote in Catechism, our bread is the one loaf for the many. That's cool. In the Beatitudes, poverty is the virtue of sharing. I love that line. Poverty Mm. is the virtue of sharing. Now, you took a vow of poverty, so you have a a sense of that. It's not just abject being poor and you get nothing. It's really a life of sharing what you have with others. Right, right, right. That's what I loved, uh, you know, my the few times I've had the chance to go to Haiti and seen people who the world would consider very, very poor— the They're gen- some of the most generous people. The generosity yeah. they have. And, You're absolutely right. And that's the virtue of poverty. Like when the yeah. Lord talks about being poor, it's this attitude of we help detached. each other. Right, and right, detached. Right, right. Yeah, we help each other. And then we get to um, this idea of the bread. And not just our bread, daily bread. So the Greek, you can correct me if I'm wrong, epiousis? Sounds great. Okay, that sounds good. Epiousis, which is literally means super essential. Like, we can't go without this. Right. Like, it's super essential. Like, it is the most important thing that we need in our life. And, of course, the fullness of that is the Eucharist. Uh, It is the medicine of immortality, without which we have no life within us. Finally, in this connection, the heavenly meaning is evident. This day is the day of the Lord. It's a feast of the kingdom anticipated in the Eucharist that is already the foretaste of the kingdom to come. For this reason, it is fitting for the Eucharistic liturgy to be celebrated every day. Isn't that a great line? The medicine of immortality. Yeah. It's the thing we yeah, most yeah. desperately yeah, so need. So like my body is wasting away, literally wasting away, and I want to be immortal 
we take the Eucharist in this. I mean, it, it sounds like a superpower, right? But right. the Eucharist is that which is going to help make me immortal. That's just a beautiful image. And the idea that as the church prays this, you know, the Eucharistic liturgy should be celebrated each day, even if you don't receive the Eucharistic, you know, if, even if you don't receive the Eucharist every day, mm -hmm. even if you can't make it to Mass every day, mm -hmm. this prayer and this petition is part of the entire prayer of the church. You might remember, if you've been listening to the other episodes that we've had on it, what do we do after the Eucharist is consecrated? We pray the Our Father prayer. We dare to pray this prayer. Right. And Give us this bread. Right. Yeah. And, and we are, you know, it's this invitation of the Lord is providing for his people. The Lord is providing for the church, the body of Christ, and giving the church the Eucharist it needs at the fullness of it in the sacrament of the Eucharist, but also just in everything, you know, whether it be the material or the spiritual we come together as a family. We recognize maybe you are in a place, you, maybe you're in a great place in your life right now. You know, maybe things are going really well. Maybe you've never known what it means to be hungry. Um, we have brothers and sisters who are having a tough time. We have brothers and sisters who are going hungry. And we, we pray this petition together with a hope and a trust in the providence of God who will take care of all of our needs and the most important need being salvation from sin. Right, right. And, and that's what we celebrate in this right. super essential gift. Yeah, it's interesting just to circle back to the statement about Corleone and Pelosi. Somebody asked him, can she go to Mass? And he said, yes. Yeah. She just can't present herself with Eucharist. And that, I thought that was even in that, that there was this, you're still welcome here, but to, to consummate it, right? To consummate yeah. it, that you can't just, in the state that you're in, you just can't do that, which, which on one level is, there's something beautiful about that. You can still come. Yeah. But it's also the beauty and the richness and the power that is in the Eucharist. Yes, you can come, but this, that's just a step you can't make. You know, maybe this is a good way to conclude it, but and I might have shared this before. I get to do a lot of ministry with evangelicals especially, and the fact that they uh, can't receive the Eucharist is painful, not in the sense that they, they might not have a fullness of, they certainly don't fully understand what Catholics believe, but, you know, their attitude is, we would let you receive our Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Why can't we receive your Eucharist? And the heart of it is the reception of the Eucharist is saying amen to everything the church believes. It's right. not just a symbol that we go up and receive, and it's right. just about us, you know, all being, we're all in it together. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. It is saying, I believe in the the transubstantiated body, blood, soul, and divinity of this Eucharist. I believe in the authority of the priest, yeah. which means I believe in the authority of the church and the scriptures that are proclaimed. And like the high point of being Catholic, your full initiation is in the Eucharist. It's, yeah, yeah, and and yeah. that's partly, I guess, it goes back to this earlier thing of it's such a serious thing for her to not be able to receive, but she's put herself in a situation where she's clearly showing, even aggressively showing, yeah that she doesn't believe everything that the church believes right. and uh, in, in, a very, in a very serious state. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because one of the, it, this sounds really odd and it's kind of a pet peeve. It's odd and it's a pet peeve of mine as well. I love hearing the communicant uh, come to com communion and say amen. There's mm -hmm. something about that proclamation of faith that I think is, is really beautiful. And there's been several times, I mean, several, lots of times that if they don't say something, I invite them. I said, you know, the body of Christ. And I realized in the extraordinary form that they don't do that. But in, in the Nova Soto, we say amen, that the rubric calls us to say amen. And I just think there's something, that very simple proclamation, amen, yes, I believe. I believe that, that the, the bread that you're giving me is not bread, but it's it's the Eucharist, and I believe in, in everything that's led us to this, in the scriptures, in the priest, and the orders. And yeah, so that's, yeah, that's really beautiful. Amen. Amen. Welcome to They That Hope with Father Dave and Deacon Bob and Heather Kim, seeing humor and hope in a crazy world. And it's awesome. Heather, you, you are our first ever guest. Ever. On really? the show. Ever. Really? Yes. Wow. Ever. We've never had a guest yeah. on the show before. Yeah, and so maybe awesome. last. So and it might be the last. Depending how this goes. <laughs> no pressure. We'll I can't how imagine how 
honored you I feel right now. I, I can barely handle it right now. Yeah. I'm just trying to hold it together. Yeah. Don't yeah. be nervous. You'll do fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Try my fine. best. This is just like abiding together, except there's no coffee. It's like abiding together with a third wheel. <laughs> <laughs> kind exactly. of like that. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And that's one petition. I think, you know, it's interesting. If you ever say it, you know, when we're in church, there's always this really odd breath that everybody takes. It's, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's almost like this subliminal, like, I don't want these two things that's to be right, connected that's to right. each other. Couldn't we just stop at the like, first Like, we're really one. saying, forgive us our trespasses. Oh, and by the way, maybe, you know, help me forgive somebody else. Anyway. Can we, wait, wait, <laughs> can I just make a point on that? It's interesting when you go to other countries where... You know, we have a cadence for how we say the prayers. They do them differently. So they may not have that break at the same place. It's just an interesting dynamic I wanted to share. How do they say that in Canada? Take off, eh? <laughs> we go, <laughs> eh? as if it was one of them. Forgive us our hosers, so eh? So if, if you're playing along at home, um, the catechism reference is, tw- and we always tell it, is 2838 to 24, uh, 2845. And it's interesting, the very beginning of this, Bob, says the petition, I love this, this petition is astonishing, right? So, and it goes on to say why it is, but at the heart of this is that Jesus' purpose and his sacrifice, it says, so that our sins might be forgiven. So just a moment or two on that, that the, the petition that we offer in this is just that, is that, and it's, it's fittingly that it's right before we receive the Eucharist, actually you preached on it this morning, is is that holiness isn't not having sin and not failing, but it's, it's God's presence and God's work in our life. But what the church invites us to do every time we come to liturgy is this, is to recognize that we've sinned and that we do that before we go. So the first part of this is, Lord, forgive us our trespasses. And, you know, that gift of mercy is connected to that next part. You know, the catechism makes a really big uh, focus on that word, as. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it notes that Jesus, this wasn't the only time Jesus used as. He liked as. Uh, Love one another as I have loved you. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so this use in this prayer really shows us the, the, the reciprocity of the, the work of mercy. And, it's, and as I was reflecting and praying about it, you know, it's not... Um, it's not like a punishment. You know, they, they don't, it can almost sound like that a little bit, right? Like, well, if you don't forgive people, I'm not going to forgive you. You know, like it's this kind of like, well, I'm going to... Quid you know, pro quo. Yeah, quid yeah, pro yeah. quo. That's not it. I think it's more along the heart of what we need to do to be able to receive God's mercy is to, is to be merciful. You know, I, I, when I was younger, um, I remember I had this weird transla- this Bible translation, and, and there was one part that talked about the unforgivable sin. And the unforgivable sin, that was like the heading of the Scripture. But it talked about if anybody blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, they can't be forgiven. And I, as a teenager, I remember I was like... I know I did that. I was so freaked out. Yeah, I was like, right. oh my gosh, wait I a second. I I, I'm, per- I'm pretty sure I did that at some point. I don't even know what it meant. And now I can't get forgiven. But then finally God explained to me, he's like, no, no, no. The, the whole reason of saying that is... If you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the grace by which you're forgiven. It's like putting a kink in the hose. Like, you can't be forgiven if you're calling the very means by which you're forgiven cursed. It, but once you stop it, then you get the grace. And it's a similar thing, I think, with this, which isn't to say, you know, a quid pro quo, no, you're a bad person until you do this, I won't do this for you. It's this idea of there's a kink in the hose of mercy, and it goes both ways. And as much as we can allow God's mercy to work in our life is as much in which we can share that mercy with others. The, the, our Father prayer is given to us in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, and it concludes with be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And so what God desires for us is transformation. He doesn't just want to put Band-Aids on our wounds. He really wants to heal us, and the fruit of receiving God's mercy is being transformed so that we can share mercy to others. And that's just, again, that's just how it is. As we are forgiven, we can forgive. And as we forgive, we can be forgiven. 
Yeah, it says in, in the, the catechism that we cannot love the God that we cannot see if we do not love the brother or sister that we do see. Yeah. I was like, ow. Ruh, ruh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know, these are the things like I was talking about last night when we truly look into our hearts, you know, like I'm constantly uh, hit with the parts of myself that I don't like, you yeah. know. I don't want to look at that, but I've found that like the more that I allow myself to enter into my own heart, you know, then I'm able to allow God's grace in there because I realize my deep need for him. It's only when I look at those things that I realize how much I desperately need him and thank God we have a savior <laughs> because we desperately need him. But I'd like to convince myself that I don't, that I'm good, that I don't need it, that it's like, oh, I forgive you, but then I'm like not operating out of the fruits of the spirit. When I relate to that person, I'm actually holding a lot of resentment. I'm holding my love back. I'm not being vulnerable. My heart has grown cold. I might like push away a little bit. So truly is that forgiveness if I say the words, but I don't back it up by loving with the fruits of the spirit. So I think there's a recognition of like what is happening in my heart in the relationships of people, especially that God has entrusted to me. It's important. Yeah. It's interesting at the, um, when, when it gets to the part about us forgiving one another, and I think it's important that we, the, our Father in Jesus is con constantly doing this, makes this connection between myself and God and then myself and my brothers and sisters that we can't live our relationship with Christ apart from relationship with one another, and that's the measure with which we often measure. But it, it goes on to say, he's already talking about the Lord's mercy and his redemption and our confession of sin. And he said, now, if this is not daunting enough, right, then the outpouring of mercy cannot penetrate our hearts as long as we have not forgiven those who have trespassed against us. It goes on, he says, in refusing to forgive our brothers and our sisters, our hearts are closed to their hardness, and it makes them impervious to God's merciful love. So this, if to the degree that I've experienced the Lord's mercy, I'm able to share that with somebody else. But, and, and it goes back forth time and time again, it says um, how difficult this is. Yep. And on 2844, it says forgiveness, and this is really beautiful to pray about, forgiveness is the high point of Christian prayer. That ability for each one of us, there's a there's sense of a prayer that we offer when we're offering forgiveness to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it's a work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I think that's an important thing. We can, you know, we've all been wounded in, in different ways. And I've met people who have been severely wounded, you know, se severely traumatized. And that action of forgiveness is, is really difficult. But you know what? What was the hardest thing for God to do to forgive us? He, he knows how difficult forgiveness is. I mean, this was his suffering on the cross. And so what we have in Christ, again, isn't somebody that's trying to, you know, smack our hand. You know, he's, he's trying to say, like, I know how hard it is to forgive. I gave my entire life in that, in that forgiveness. And he gives, us, he gives us grace to forgive. You know, forgiveness does begin with a choice that we want to forgive. I, th I think, you know, forgiveness isn't, you know, just an emotional thing about I feel better about this. We, we have to come to a place where, Lord, I'm, this person hurt me. I'm angry at this person, but I, I want to forgive. And, and we ask for the grace for that, and that's part of this prayer. Like, I want to be forgiven, and I want to forgive. And, and many times, it's not something, like, just like our own virtue, we can't just, you know, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and decide to do it. I mean, if we're hurt, we're hurt, and painful situations, and we've all had them. But asking the Lord to start changing our hearts, I mean, I find for me that that's really the key. And it, and it has to do with a, a genuine encounter of God's mercy. I, I sometimes dodge God's mercy in my own life. I, I'm, a, I'm a master of self-denial. And I will, um, I like to just kind of play off things, my sins, and like, that's ah, probably not that big of a deal. And yeah, you know me, and anyway, right? And, and the, the problem is when I dodge that mercy, um, I dodge the ability to be merciful to others. Because if I don't really allow myself just to be caught dead to rights with no excuses, I always have excuses, with no excuses or explanations, except, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. When we can have those moments of God, when we, can, when we know God's love is so great that we can be that vulnerable before God with our own sin, that's the moment that we're not only transformed by mercy, but certainly in my own life, I've been able to find reservoirs of mercy for others that have hurt me that I, that I just never really thought possible. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was a recognition of, 
I don't know if I've really let God forgive me unconditionally, mm -hmm. no explanation, no excuses. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's a transforming moment. Yeah, the leaning into mercy and leaning into what God has that we don't is, I think, incredibly important. Because when I look at people in my life that have really hurt me, I think I'm not capable of doing what's required to heal this. And it's especially hard, and I know that many of you know what I'm talking about, when the person's never going to say they were sorry. Mm -hmm. They're never going to ask for forgiveness. Those are the hardest ones because you're just left with things undone and um, you don't have that sense of closure or like something to respond to. But as I've journeyed into those places in my own life, like the Lord has really so gently walked me through a lot of memories and he's been the one that I've been able to converse with about my hurt and the grace that comes is, has been incredible in my life. Like I've truly seen memories and relationships be transformed just through doing my own work with God, but also um, as much as we have to be connected with each other and our relationship with God, like I think we can lean on people who can help us in that journey. You know, whether it be a really good counselor mm -hmm. or a good priest, spiritual director, who knows how to help us navigate those places in our hearts where there's walls. Forgiveness can be one of the hardest things to do, yet when we try to do it on our own, it's actually impossible. It's impossible. I think what you said is important, Heather, and, and actually maybe to start with what you're saying is that, just to reiterate that, uh, Mercy, forgiveness, it's a choice, it's a decision, it's an act of the will. I always tell people, if you're only going to forgive when your heart feels like it, you're never going to forgive. But our heart follows that choice and that decision so that I can, I mean, there's been many times in my life that it's not that complicated. I find myself in a situation, I said, I'm going to forgive because, Lord, you've forgiven me and there's no other way. I mean, how unfair it would be that you've been so merciful time and time and time again, but this person, I'm going to hold this minor offense against them. So the only reason I do it is because the Lord has forgiven me. And, and if that's the only thing, it's imperfect, but at least it's what I have to offer. And then sometimes that's one, two, three, ten times, and then my heart eventually begins to follow that. But it's, it's almost always an act of the will and a choice. But what you said, Heather, is important, and especially as, you know, as I think family life is, this is the case so oftentimes, and that is that it's hard to forgive those people that are not going to ever ask for forgiveness, and it's also hard to forgive those people that are going to do it again. You know, and, and it's a situation in religious life as well is that I'm confronted with, with offering forgiveness and mercy with a full recognition that they are me and I'm them, and that tomorrow I'm probably going to do it again. You know, and that, that continual grace of being able to offer forgiveness and, and to be on the receiving end of it how can, how can we withhold that? But maybe just a word about that. How do you offer forgiveness knowing that the people you love and care for, you're going to do it again? It's the hardest. It's the hardest. And it's the best. Yeah. You know, like relationships of love are the best. I think about my kids and my husband especially. It's the best. It's the greatest joy in my life. And it pains me to know that I'm going to hurt them. It pains me to think about the times that I have hurt them and I know I've hurt them. Um, but the repair that occurs and to be able to go to one another and say, I'm so sorry, like, will you forgive me? And, and follow up questions, please tell me how I can love you better mm -hmm. in this. Like, what are you needing from me right now? Like, how can I repair this? You know, to try to speak the messages. Like, that's one of the things that we try to do in our family a lot is like, what are the messages that we really want each other to know, that we want our kids to know, that as spouses, we want each other to know that combat the enemy's lies in our life. So even in the areas of forgiveness, it's like reiterating where I hurt you. Like, I'm gonna tell you, I'm so sorry. I really love you. I'm really committed to you. And I wanna know, like, what's happening in your world or whatever it is, to just let the person know, like, I'm actually for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm weak, but I'm for you, like I'm on your team, so, yeah. yeah. One of my favorite uh, letters of John Paul II is he had a whole letter on the mercy of God, and um, he talked about um, the merciful love of God, and in Hebrew, there's the, one of the words for love is also mercy, it's, it's, a, it's a similar word. And he said so beautifully, he said that um, mercy is an indispensable element of God's love. And then he said, it is, as it were, love's second name. And I've just always come back to that idea that when we talk about God is love, it's God is mercy. It is, it is God is a merciful love. And the reason we're praying the Our Father prayer, the reason Jesus is giving us this prayer 
that he's praying to the Father and that we pray with him when we pray it is because he wants us to, to be like as the Heavenly Father is perfect. He wants us to be like God. That, that is, that's our birthright. You know, what child doesn't want to become like their father? And in baptism, we become sons and daughters of God and inheriting the kingdom that is promised for us. And so that's really at the heart of all of these petitions, but especially this one. I think this is the most poignant one. I mean, this is really the, the most sensitive one, I think, of, of all of them. This idea that it's Jesus' desire that we would be like him, that we would be like the Father. This is why he's sending the Holy Spirit into our hearts and into our lives. And so this petition, then, is a cause of joy. You know, that forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us because we're really praying for the grace to do both of those things. You know, this is why it's a prayer. This is why we're asking our daddy, daddy, can I be more like you in this? Can I be more like you, first of all, in the way in which I receive your mercy? And can I be more like you in the way in which that I would share your mercy with others? And it says earlier in that section in prayer that humility is the foundation of all prayer that we're always coming to God aware that we're asking because we can't do it on our own. And it's just bigger than we are. And, and those are the miracles. I mean, I think the miracle of forgiveness, you know, it might not be as flashy as a, a broken limb being healed or other things like that, but it is, it is the most, forgiveness is the most incredible power in the universe. And that's, again, what, what Jesus gave us on the cross, that, that symbol of love and, and symbol, that symbol, that sign of his love, that action of his love. It's that truly a work of life. the spirit. Like forgiveness is truly yep. a yep. work of the spirit. I was just sitting here reflecting on the scripture for this weekend. And after, you know, the spirit of the, of the Lord is upon me, one of the things it says is to proclaim freedom to the captives. And I was thinking, aren't we often the ones who are holding another in captivity? Mm -hmm. And our calling is to set people free, to just say, I release you. Like you don't deserve it. And I think I don't deserve what God has given to me. I, I have gone sideways thousands of times, you know? And, and I've wept in the car of just like experiencing the mercy of God for me in my life. I'm so undeserving of this, you know? And that's how I need to view another. It, they don't deserve it. They don't deserve our forgiveness. But for us to be able to give that freely is a work of the spirit. So like if you're struggling, I just wanna encourage you, beg the spirit to come. Beg the spirit to come so that you can be one who sets captives free. It is. It, it, it's a way that we actually share in the divine nature of God. That, and that, that's, as you said, that that's our goal is we're divinized. We become more and more like God and to the degree that we're able to forgive more, we become more like him. Um, may, maybe to close, that it's, it's fitting that we obviously do this in the Eucharist. Uh, at the end of this particular section of the catechism there, it says, there is no limit or measure to the essential divine forgiveness whether one speaks of sin, as we hear in Luke, or debts, as we hear in Matthew. He, and then he goes on to say, we are always debtor. Owe to no one anything except to love one another. The communion of the Holy Trinity is the source and criterion of truth in every relationship, and it is lived out in prayer above all in the Eucharist. So again, it's fitting that, that we say the Our Father moments before we're going to go and encounter Jesus in the Eucharist, that Augustine would speak of the total Christ, that, that we receive Christ in his divinity in the, in the body of in the Eucharist, but it's also Christ's body in the people gathered here. And, and Augustine would go on to say, you're so careful not to drop Christ, right? You're so cautious not to drop him, um, but you'll drop the brother or sister next to you and you won't care for them and you won't love for them and you won't show mercy to them. Thank you, Augustine. Thanks. Yeah, so th this, this invitation for us, and in, in, as you stated, Heather, it's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And to the degree that it's closer to our heart, it's more difficult. But the Spirit of God can always free, n not, not just free them, but free us and allow us to be able to offer that mercy and forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, but today we're talking about, and lead us not into temptation. Um, and the catechism begins by talking about how difficult it is to translate the Greek verb in this petition. Um, it says the Greek verb is used by a single English word. The Greek means both do not allow us to enter into temptation and do not let us yield 
to temptation. Uh, you might remember a few years ago, and I was sharing with Father Dave before we recorded, I, I did a bit of a deep dive on this. Uh, you, I heard in the news that St. Francis is changing the, or Pope Francis, rather, is changing the Our Father prayer. And because he didn't like, this is how the news was portraying it, didn't like the way it was phrased, lead us not into temptation, and wanted it to be changed something more along the lines of do not let us be led into temptation, which might actually be a bit more accurate. Now, this is just a little asterisk. Uh, if you ever want to learn anything about Catholicism, do not learn it from Fox, CNN, or USA Today. Right, right. So, C- CSNBC is fine. Yeah, of course. But Rachel Maddow yeah, yeah, really yeah, has her finger on the pulse got of it. Catholicism. Yeah, she's got it. So um, I— That was I, one. Let me just, on a side note, this whole thing with Pelosi and Cordovione, I, I was amazed that these people had come out. It's like, well, you know, I went and read the catechism. And, <laughs> and they said, really? So you're now our Catholic theologian. It's right, they know it. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to read it, folks. I read an know article it. one time. That's right. Yeah. I'm reading a teleprompter right, right now, That's and what right. it says is... I'm Catholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Anyway. So anyway, just a little history on it. This wasn't Pope Francis's idea. Uh, actually, 2002... Was that J.P. Pope John Paul II. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The Italian Biblical Commission had asked to change the translation in the Italian version of the Bible. It was approved a few years later. I think that was why Benedict was Pope. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2017, the French decided to change it for its scripture and also for the liturgy. And that's when Pope Francis spoke up and said, I think this is a fantastic idea. But okay. it wasn't really his idea. And just to be clear, when you say change it, it's not like to some totally Change fabricated, translation. fabricated right. thing. But right. the, like you, you opened with is that there are two tension, you know, two translations that are in tension with each other. So right. it's not like that's, oh, let's just change it. Right, yeah, yeah nothing yeah. was changed. It's actually trying to get back to the original yeah. Greek and articulate it more. Two years later, it was approved in Italy uh, for those liturgies. And again, Francis was cool with it. But, uh, you know, when I first Googled it and I started reading, again, the Fox, the CNN, they were all saying, and so he's changing it for everybody. Pope Francis is changing Pope it. Pope Francis. Yeah. But um, no, actually, it's just changed in French and Italian. Then the, the article that I read that was a bit more of a deep dive from a Catholic source said, uh, the uh, head of the English translation said, we've not been asked to change it, and we don't have any intention <laughs> to yeah, change yeah. it. So that's just a little aside when you hear this uh, about it. But the heart of it was, I think, you know, his little catechesis on it was really quite accurate, which is to say, it's not that God leads us into temptation. That could be the wrong way of interpreting that language. You go to the letter of James, and it says that God doesn't tempt us. God tests us. And the difference being God will provide many opportunities for us to grow in virtue and holiness, but he's not providing opportunities for us to fall into to sinfulness. In sin, exactly. um, that's what the devil does, and that's the next petition. We won't try to jump ahead to that too much. No, we won't. But the idea behind it is that we're asking God to protect us from temptation, from sin. Um, and I like how it talks about discernment. The Holy Spirit helps us discern. This is uh, 2847 in the Catechism. Between trials, which are necessary for the growth of the inner man, and temptation, which leads to sin and to death. It says we also must discern between being tempted and consenting to temptation. And, and that's, that's a whole other thing. I, I actually, Scott Hahn, I think, had my favorite phrase about it. He said, there's a difference between entertaining a thought and letting a thought entertain you. Well, there's a famous line from um, Bishop, I was just going to blank, hmm. 50s. Uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen. Yeah, Fulton Sheen. Yeah. Uh, where somebody asked him, are you, are you entertained by lustful <laughs> thoughts? He said, no, they entertain me. You <laughs> right, know? So right. just that, again, that, that's a quote from he, whether or not it's true, it's, it's certainly attributed to him, but that's absolutely right, is that I always, you know, when, when people come in and they, they repent for maybe lust or something like that, one of the things I always ask them is, what's going on before that? Because yeah. it's almost always is that we open a door to that. And that's really what it's saying is like, don't let me open the door right. to those temptations that, that might lead to ultimately more serious sin. You know, the act of contrition, you know, part of what we say is help me avoid all occasions of sin. And I think that, you know, goes back to our conversations in our earlier uh, segments on the virtues, that, that virtue of prudence, you know, that would be able to, you know, avoid beginnings, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. really that that is such a powerful way to stay in God's grace and to stay in the light of holiness is if we can avoid the beginnings of things, because if we let the snowball happen, then by the time, uh, you know, by the time the the temptation is really at its fullness, we are at our weakness, you know, and and, and with that. The other thing Bob that I thought was good was the 
the trials that are necessary. Yeah. You know, that like in, in athletics or in music, if you're training to become better at whatever, there are difficulties and struggles that have to be worked through so as to be able to become a more proficient musician or athlete. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think it's the same thing in the spiritual life is that some of these trials are necessary to help us, first off, a sense of confidence, right, that I really can overcome this, mm -hmm. that I really am strong enough, that God's grace really is big enough. Yeah. So that once we experience that, it's we become more, again, more confident in, in our, our walk with the Lord. So I think sometimes we say, try to do away with all trials. No. No. Just give me the grace to be able to sustain them and work through them. And be able to discern the trial, which is an opportunity for holiness, and that's something that God might be putting in our life, and a temptation, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is really more born out of our own sinful desires. Mm -hmm. As St. Ignatius would talk about the world, the flesh, the devil, mm -hmm. you know, all those, you know, kind of discernments. And it does talk about the battle of this. Um, I love this, 2848, lead us not into temptation implies a decision of the heart. For wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It is an ascent to the Holy Spirit, the Father, who gives us strength. Mm -hmm. And it's a battle. Uh, and such a battle and victory can only be accomplished through prayer. And that's why we pray this petition, you know, that we're really asking the Lord uh, for the grace to uh, avoid occasions of sin to avoid temptation, to embrace what he gives us, and, and to believe that he has overcome sin and death, which brings us to the next petition, which we're not going to get to, but no, it really th there's, a, there's a synergy between these two of leading us not into temptation and delivering us from evil. But that idea of the temptation is really the, the things that we will face in this life. Uh, we have a God who can help us overcome those by his, by his grace and his will and his strength, and most importantly, his love, and that's what the Father can give us. Amen. Amen. So lead us not into temptation. Yes. Can I say one word about translations? You may. The absolution prayer at confession is getting a new translation. I heard about that. Yeah. What do you think about that? It's only three words that are different. Okay. What other words? The words are right now we say, uh, God the Father, mercy through death, his fire, his his fire, and so forth to himself. And it's sent the Holy Spirit. It's now it's poured, poured, yeah. poured out the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Among us for the forgiveness of sins. God give you pardon and peace. It's now may God grant you. Okay. Wait, what is it? No, wait, it is. God the Father, mercy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's now give instead of grant. Okay. Yep, that's it. Yeah. There you have it. Folks. For those listening, he didn't fall into a hypnotic trance. He was actually just trying to recall the <laughs> yeah, words. Yeah, yeah, the prayers of absolution. It's one of those things. Yeah. Well, and the church will keep doing this uh, sure. as a way that at different times, trying to just be more authentic to the original texts, the original prayers. And yeah, it's and what are you really trying to say? That. Yeah, I agree. agree. Yeah. Amen. Agree. We have a very apropos finish for the petitions and that is drum roll please <laughs> deliver I, us from evil the final petition of the our father prayer yes and if you're paying attention and looking at the catechism it starts at 2850 and i like what it says it says the last petition of the our father is also jesus's prayer i am not asking you to take them out of the world but i will ask you to protect them from the evil one and the catechism goes on that says that this petition is, it's not like this, it, the word it uses is an abstraction, it's not a philosophy, it's not an idea, but it's a reality. Mm. And when Jesus says, protect them from the evil one, it's not just evil influences, but it's literally the evil one. And, and you know, we don't, r rightly so, I mean, we're not consumed or constantly, some people I've met are just, like, they just, are in constant fear of the evil one and just think the evil one is is behind everything that happens in their life and i, I think there's an extreme that that some people go to that we ought not go there but also we we, we cannot deny the fact that there is an evil one if there is a kingdom of god if there's a kingdom of god's light the kingdom of his presence if god is real uh then we also have to accept the reality that there there's an evil one and the evil one has a goal and a plan and a desire and that is uh, it's not be too hard, but our destruction. I mean, that is what the evil one wants to do. He wants to destroy me. He wants to separate me from God and God's love and God's mercy and God's plan for my life. And and ultimately, the evil one wants to see that that we don't aren't and are not able to inherit the kingdom of God. So when Jesus says, "I'm not speaking of the world, but protect them from the evil one," he's literally saying, "Protect them from the devil, from the diablo." The, the catechism says. 
uh, he is referring referring to a person, Satan, the evil one, or the angel who opposes God. Goes on to say he's a murderer. He's a liar from the beginning. He is the deceiver of the world. Through him, sin and death have entered the world. So Jesus is praying for not just his disciples, but for each one of us. So that every time we conclude the, and it's fitting that we conclude the Our Father saying, you know, Father, deliver us from that one. Protect us from that one. Allow us to stay in your grace, to stay in your mercy, to stay in your protection. I often think of the of the role of our guardian angel that helps us facilitate that, participate that in the protection of the Lord. So it, it's very fitting the way the, the our Father closes us and brings us to a conclusion with that. You know, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said that there's two lies the devil would have us to believe. The first is that he doesn't exist. So, you know, the devil would, would prefer us to live in a world where we're not thinking about spiritual matters, we're not thinking of the spiritual battle that we're all called to fight every day in our lives. Uh, let's just, you know, imagine the devil, you know, with a pitchfork and pointy, you know, pointy hat and is a stereotype and he's something to scare kids, but we go out throughout our day, right? Well, then if that first lie doesn't work, when we become an awareness of the existence of the devil, the existence of the evil one, the next lie is to attribute everything to him and to exactly. equate him as equal to God, you know, like... Uh, this idea that there's this force of like it's God and it's the devil and it's this death match where they're evenly, you know, e have equal powers yeah, and are yeah. fighting let's, each let's, other, let's, right? Let's see how this is going to turn out, this battle, right? Right. Whereas the reality of it is neither of those. Yes, there is a devil, but he is certainly nowhere near equal to God, not even equal to our Blessed Mother. One of the reasons why we pray to St. Michael is because that's more of an even battle, St. Michael versus the devil. But of course, St. Michael has... <laughs> God behind him. And so we need not live in fear of the devil. In fact, what we celebrate, particularly at every liturgy, is the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, which conquered death, conquered the evil one, and sets us free. And so at the conclusion of this prayer, we are really claiming the victory that Christ won for us on the cross. Uh, we're claiming the deliverance because though God is way more powerful than the devil, the devil is way more powerful than we are. And we need the protection of God, we need the help of God, the grace of God, which he gives us in the sacraments, particularly our baptism, uh, that we can go out every day and we can live as sons and daughters of God. And, you know, part of the reason we pray this prayer is that it should be increasing our awareness. I think that's what's beautiful about all of these petitions. You know, we're, you know, I love how in the Eucharistic prayer it says, our prayers don't add anything to your glory. You know, they're really more helpful for us. And that can also be said of this particular prayer. You know, God is, his name is holy. His will is going to be done whether we pray this prayer or not. And yet these prayers and these petitions, when I pray them in the morning, it's a good reminder. I get to this end and I go, deliver us from evil. And I go, yeah, wait a second. Hey, spiritual battle going on. You know, put on the armor of God. You know, be, be sensitive to the movement of God and the, the protection of my guardian angels and... Uh, the salvation that God won for me this day that I can live out and I can proclaim that with joy. Uh, it's a real powerful way to conclude a prayer. And, and in many ways, it's a very sobering way of doing so. But it's a way of recapping salvation history. I'm now being reminded of everything that God has done for me so far. And why wouldn't he do that for me today as well? That's right. And, and I think what you said is really good. It's just that I think we need to have a healthy, holy awareness of it, that, that we're not consumed. I, I, I remember the moral theology course I took at Franciscan that says that, that there's the world, the flesh, and the devil, and, and there's this cooperation. Obviously, the evil one's behind that, but some of it is just also the flesh, and, and that's where he says, I like, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, just protect us from evil. But we need to be, in our flesh, we need to be attentive to that. I mean, it's not fair for an individual to say, Lord, you know, protect me from particular sins, or, or protect me from the sin of lust, or protect me from this. And then if an individual is, is watching things on TV that aren't appropriate, or viewing things on the internet that aren't good for their spirit, then there's this sense that, you know, we're asking the Lord to protect us, but we're not also doing our part. So we need to um, make sure that we don't open a door or open a window that allows the evil to enter into our heart or enter into our soul or, you know, 
And, and oftentimes the reality is that's done through our eyes and through what, what we look at. So we pray that the Lord would deliver us evil. We pray for his protection. We pray that we ought not have to have, you know, this battle with the evil one. But also, and you said it, that, that it's not a fair fight, that that we can call on the power of Jesus to be present to us, on the power of his Holy Spirit to bless us in situations that we find ourselves with temptation or struggle or fear or, or whatever's going on, and that the Lord is present in that. So just to be able to take advantage of that, take advantage of the grace of the Lord that is present for us in the midst of in, in the midst of a battle. The battle's been fought, like you said, by Jesus' death and resurrection. The victory's been won. We need to be able to stand, stand on that and claim that. Amen? Amen. And we also want to remember, uh, and I think one last thing to highlight with this, is that it's not just deliver me from evil. It's deliver yeah. us from evil. So certainly as I pray from the, the Our Father prayer, I'm aware of my own need of salvation. I'm praying for the church. I'm praying for the body of Christ. I'm praying for all you know those that are fighting this battle of faith in the world. And I'm reminded that I'm not alone. This is something the devil would like us to think, that you know we're just isolated and we're the only ones dealing with these issues, right? Every day, everybody's waking up. And as a church, we are all praying this beautiful prayer together. I mean, it's in the Liturgy of the Hours. It's in the Mass. I mean, this is the perfect prayer of Christ. And so even that lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, um, all of that really connects to the fact that, going back to the you know beginning of the prayer, God is our Father. We are praying this together as a community. And so even if here I am in my hotel room in Stevensville, Virginia, and I'm praying the Our Father by myself, I'm not praying it by myself. I'm praying it with the body of Christ, who is just constantly asking for all of these petitions to be granted. And particularly in that spiritual battle to know um, that, hey, the, as we've seen with the scandals and the issues, like I'm praying for the church, like that this body of Christ, the people of God, would also be delivered from evil. And it says this really beautifully at 2854. When we ask to be delivered from the evil one, we pray as well to be freed from all evils, present, past, and future, of which he, the devil, is the author or instigator. In this final sure. petition, the church brings before the Father all the distress of the world, along with deliverance from the evils that overwhelm humanity. She implores the precious gift of peace and the grace of perseverance in the expectation of Christ's return. And that's really what it's about. We kind of come to the conclusion of the prayer and, you know, deliverance of the evil one will happen specifically when Christ comes again. That sure. is the consummation. You know, that's when the accuser of our brothers is cast out, as we hear in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And so we're really praying for the end of the world. <laughs> you know, we're, we're really praying for that. You know, he's already won the victory. He just hasn't done the victory parade yet. Um, you know, he, his patience is our salvation. And... So with this prayer, we conclude by saying we can't wait for that moment when the dead rise again and we are all gathered together in a family and there is no more evil one and there is no more temptation and there is no more crying and there's no more sickness and there's no more death. All things are consummated to the glory of our Father who art in heaven. It's Amen. amazing. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, just maybe my last thought on that part is that we we so casually say the our father and that's why i've enjoyed and appreciated just spending some time with it i mean we just kind of rattle it off it's one of the first prayers we've all learned but to be able to realize the power that there is in that prayer and and what we're asking for and what's taking place and the role that we have in the salvation obviously of ourselves but also bring other people in that prayer to to christ and, and to the father and uh, so, yeah, my, my hope and my prayer is that the next time you, we, whoever's listening says to our Father, that we understand more deeply what it is that we're praying for and what it is that we're saying. So this has been great, Bob. Yeah, so why don't we conclude by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May the blessing of God be upon all of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks everybody for listening. Keep us in your prayers. 
uh, this next upcoming month. And, you know, if you have an idea of maybe another kind of topic that you'd like us to hit on our podcast, you can email us at hope at franciscan.edu. That's hope at franciscan.edu. God bless.